So I'm going to talk about a method of calibrating complex models called history matching. Um, so the sort of models I'm talking about are complex numerical codes. So there's an example up in the top right hand corner which is a model of a heart and that takes about six hours on a fairly serious computer to compute one beat of the heart. Your body does it a lot faster than that. <laughs> um, so these things take many hours to run. So we can't afford to do Monte Carlo or Markov chain Monte Carlo on that model. Um, but we do want to do inference. We want to fit these models to data. So let's just think about complex numerical models. So we start off with some real world problem. We then build a mathematical model of that with a set of PDEs or ODEs or whatever. And then, unless we're very lucky, we discretize those onto some finite element or finite difference mesh. And then we take that finite element mesh and we build some computer code. And finally, I'm going to build a model of that model, an emulator. So by the time we get here, we're a long way from here. <laughs> and that's one of the themes of my talk, is that we want to make inference about here, but we've gone all the way down here, and we have to come all the way back, and we have to acknowledge that every step along there, we've made an approximation. Our real world model is not, the, it certainly isn't the same as my emulator, but it also isn't the same as our computer code. It isn't the same even as our mathematical model. I'm going to treat my model as a black box. And that means I'm not allowed to change the code. I, you give me the code and I won't touch it, which is probably a good thing because I just mess it up. Um, so we can't use intrusive methods. All our methods are non-intrusive. And that's a little frustrating. Um, sometimes we'd love to have grey box models where we could tinker, but we, we don't allow ourselves to do that. The good thing about that is, one, I can use your code and you don't ever have to give it to me. I can just say, run it here, and you just send me the answers back. And that means I can work on proprietary models or commercial codes. Uh, so we've done work with CFD models where no one will let you see the code because it costs thousands and thousands of pounds. So I'm going to use what I call an emulator. I'm going to model the model. So emulators are surrogate models. So they're cheap versions of your model. But I'm going to use emulator to mean a surrogate model that includes a measure of its own uncertainty. So it tells me how well it's doing. Um, we use Gaussian processes. Uh, sometimes I call that shallow learning in uh, contrast to deep learning. Um, unlike a lot of people who use Gaussian process regression, we include a mean term. We think that's very important. And we're going to use low order polynomials. And that's going to take out the large scale variation of your model. If you just fit a quadratic, you can get most of what's going on. Um, we could just use polynomials. Um, they're sometimes known as lightweight emulators, so I just fit a polynomial. I don't like the error structure of polynomials for this sort of thing, and I'll show why in a minute. You can use deep learning, um, but you need vast numbers of model runners to do deep learning, and it doesn't, unless you do something very clever, you don't get a measure of your uncertainty. Um, So let's see how I build an emulator. So there's my true model. That's a really complicated model. I think that's x plus cos 2x or something like that. <laughs> but that's my complex numerical model. And I'm just going to run it four times. And then I'm going to take away the full model. I've just got those four numbers. Uh, I fit a Gaussian process to that. So here we have, this is the mean of the Gaussian process, and this is plus or minus two standard deviations. And the nice thing about this is I have the prior that where I've run the model, I know what's going on. 
So I want no uncertainty there, and then the uncertainty grows. And if you fit it to polynomial, you get the same error everywhere, which is why a Gaussian process is really nice. It has exactly the properties that I want from my model. And if I now put the model back on, we've done pretty well. Mm. Um, I didn't tell you anything about the structure of the model, apart from those four numbers. So we can fit the numbers, and these uncertainties allow us to say, my uncertainty is one, my uncertainty is really big here, I'm going to put another point there, and that will pull it in and the uncertainty will collapse. So I can use the properties of the fact that I've got the uncertainty to tell me about my emulator. So, this is a deterministic model, so I'm talking mainly about deterministic models. Um, where does the uncertainty come from? <laughs> um, so, even for deterministic models, even for engineering models, the most certain models we probably have, the model of a bending of a beam, um, the model inputs are uncertain. We, we might know, well, model inputs are uncertain, so we don't know everything go for our beam, we don't know Young's modulus all the way across our beam, um, and the model structure is uncertain. And that's particularly true, I think, for biological systems. Engineering systems, we still don't know model structure properly. Um, biological systems are much more uncertain. Um, and I'll come back to model structure. But you put in some not distributed inputs, and then you're going to get some unknown distribution outputs. And of course, particularly with biological models, often they're not deterministic, they're often um, stochastic. Um, the last two years I've done a lot of work with COVID models, I think a lot of us have done work with COVID models over the last two, two years, and a lot of those are inherently stochastic. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about stochastic models. If you want, you can ask me at the end, and I'll explain how we generalize what we have to stochastic models. Monte Carlo, the classic way of propagating uncertainty through some model. Uh, I'm going to include Mon Markov chain Monte Carlo and all its flavors in, under Monte Carlo. It requires many thousands of runs. Even the best MCMCs require a lot of computation. And if you've got a model that takes six hours to run, uh, some climate models I work with take a month to run, you just can't do that. <laughs> um, so we can't afford Monte Carlo. Of course, we can afford Monte Carlo with my emulator, <laughs> and that's what we're going to do some of the time. So now we want to do inference on our model, and I'm going to generalize inference beyond what some people call. I'm going to talk about the uncritically quantification of that model. What is the uncertainty? of propagating things through the model. Sensitivity analysis, which, um, which of the inputs are actually important. Most of the time, I think, these days I think about dimension reduction rather than inference. How many of the thousands of inputs in some models can we compress down to something we can actually do computation on? Uncertainty analysis, propagation of uncertainty through the model. And what I'm going to talk about and what history matching is inverse modeling model calibration, model tuning, statistical inference, call it what you like, but trying to estimate the parameters of the model from some data. Now, in this system, we actually have two levels of inference. We have inference where we build the emulator. We have to estimate the emulator from the data, and then we inference to, to relate to the numerical model of the real world, and you can call that. So calibration, tuning, inverse modeling, there's loads of terms people use. Uh, they're all basically the same thing. So, to build the emulator, I'll do that inference first. That's basically where do we do the model... Well, one of the big problems is where do we do the model runs? We can't afford to do many runs, so every run counts. So, what we want is some space-filling design, and a lot of work in uncertainty quantification is about experimental design. Um, so we want something that fills space, uh, and that's a Latin hypercube filling space there. 
and recently we've started thinking about sequential design where you fill space and then you put some extra points in and every extra point of course costs so you want to put it in the best place and again talk to me afterwards if you want to or Hussein my postdoctor about sequential design because that's a really exciting interesting topic I'm not going to talk about that in fact I'm going to skip over these design slides because I don't need so we run our model at some carefully set of places and then we fit our Gaussian process and we can either use maximum likelihood or we can use some base type method um, now most of our parameters are nice and linear so that's easy so all our polynomial parameters our mean parameters our variance parameter we can solve those analytically conditional on knowing the length scales and what are called the nuggets um, from this model so the length scales are the wiggliness of my Gaussian process and the nuggets sometimes we put um, little random noise terms um, usually just for computational reasons to make sure all our matrices invert <laughs> now you can't estimate those simply um, so you can do full base you can do an MCMC to calculate them and that works quite well uh, I tend not to I'm very lazy I tend to just plug in MLE estimates <laughs> Um, so I have a full base for the linear parameters and the nonlinear parameters I just use a plugin. You don't lose much uncertainty that way. However, the likelihood surface is complex and there are other maximum likelihood solutions, posteriors. In particular, there's always a second solution, or I think there's always a second solution where your Gaussian process goes, well, it just becomes white noise. You say it's flat plus white noise. <laughs> and that fits the data quite nicely. It'll validate. It's absolutely useless as, a, as an emulator. And it's often the second peak in the likelihood surface. So you have to be careful. Um, it's quite hard to build good emulators. It's really easy to build bad ones. <laughs> Okay, let's come back to the thing I started with, the relationship between models and the real world. So models are designed to inform us about the real world. That's a... everyone knows that. That's a stupid question. But they're not the same as the real world. The model and the real world are different things. We can build lots of models and they are different. Um, this one is slightly contentious. The real world is not the set of equations, but I would maintain the real world is something much more complicated than a set of equations. And the discretized equations are not the continuum equations, and the code is not the same as the discretized equations, and the only thing we have to handle is the code. I've, I've even said it's a black box model, so all I have is the code. Um, but really all we have is the code. Because we have to run this in computer, we cannot solve it analytically. So everyone knows that quote, all models are wrong, but some are useful. There's another great quote from George Box. Um, Statisticians are like artists. They have a disturbing tendency to fall in love with their models. <laughs> and we do. I mean, models love their models. Um, they spend their entire career building them. Um, and they're wonderful. I love computer models. I, I'm going to be very critical of computer models, but I think they're fantastic. Um, so model discrepancy is the difference between the model and the real world. It's the fact that we omitted lots of processes when we did the PDE. Am I running out of time? <laughs> um, so we have to take this into account that our model isn't correct. So if you do least squares, or Bayesian calibration, you'll get the wrong answer. Because we've constrained our model to lie on a manifold, which is the solution to the PDEs, and the real world isn't on that manifold, if you did the least squares or Bayesian calibration, you'll find the nearest point on the manifold to the data, 
but you won't actually get the data because the data is not on the manifold and the more data you collect the more certain you will appear to be but you're still on the manifold that isn't near the data <laughs> so you have to be very careful model discrepancy means that just minimizing some loss function is not going to get you to the right place it's going to you're going to overfit okay so there's a classic paper about this Kennedy and Hagen 2001 and they come up with a wonderful scheme so I showed that you could model an emulator of the data with a Gaussian process you can have a second Gaussian process that models okay the um, difference between the model and the real, the discrepancy. And that's really cool, it's a wonderful idea. Trouble is, you have horrendous identifiability problems. Let me just go a little bit faster. Um, you, you find for prediction, we know the sum of the GPs, but you can't identify it. You can put strong priors on. I'm going to show an example with 20 parameters. You can't have strong priors on 20 parameters. So, the alternative is what I'm going to, it was called history matching. So we don't try and find the best set of parameters, because that's hard. So what we do is we find those inputs that are implausible given the data. So what inputs could not give you the data? And that's a lot easier. I like easy problems, so there's no optimization. I, Optimization is a wonderful problem, but it's really hard. So we're not going to do that. We're not going to do any optimization. All we're going to do is find all models that couldn't be anywhere near the data, and what's left has to include the best fit. <laughs> there's no prior, there's no posterior, there's no MCMC, there's no base. <laughs> okay? This is geometry. So we set up a measure of the distance between the data and the model prediction. So Here's my data, here's my model, there's my model inputs. And if that distance is too far, then that value of x is it plausible and we just don't consider it. So now we expand that variance term and that gives us the variance of the data and the variance of the model and I assume they're independent because one's the data and one's a model. Um, and if that implausibility is greater than three, we say that those inputs are implausible. And three, there's a very nice paper by Pokosham in 94, who shows that any unimodal distribution, three standard deviations is 95%. Okay? You can't get worse than, than three. But that's expensive, because I haven't yet replaced F with my emulator. So now I'm going to take F out and put the emulator in. And we get this formula. So this is our data. The expected value of the emulator. Oh, there's a bracket missing. That should be the square distance. And then we scale it by three variances. The variance of the data, which we I'm going to say no. The variance of the emulator, which we do know. And a model discrepancy term. So that's the difference between the data between the world and the model. I, unlike Kennedy or Hagen, I'm not going to estimate that. Whoops. <laughs> I'm not going to estimate that. I'm going to um, assume that's no. We're going to uh, get that from our experts. So we collect data, run a designed experiment with my computer model, build my emulator, perform the history matching, rule out points that are deemed to be implausible, and if we have lots of metrics, we just take the maximum possibility. And those constitute what's called the not ruled out yet space, NRI. And then we do a second computer experiment within that NRI space. We rebuild our emulator. We history match again. And we keep going until NRI is either small enough that I don't care anymore, or stop shrinking, in which case the data's I've run out of stuff in the or goes to zero. There's a third one. I'll come back to that in a minute. At which point we need more data. So here's an example. This is my true model, the black line. I've got three model runs. I've got a data point here, if you can see it, cyan, with some uncertainty on it. There's my emulator. 
This is not ruled out because it's near the data. This is not ruled out because my emulator is really bad out there. Whoops. <laughs> and I do an extra point, extra couple of points. And the emulator now gets good here. And down here, it's basically the data error. Whoops, the data error was the only thing not making my emulator smaller. I can't, any more computer model ones are not going to help me. So, let's, a cardiac model, courtesy of Steve Niederer. Okay, 20 parameters, and we're looking into, this is Enroy in 20 dimensional space, so we're looking in two dimensions at a time, or one dimension down here, this is after one run, and our Enroy is 25% of the space, these two parameters here, this one and this one, actually are the same, <laughs> they, I think they did know it, they didn't tell us, you can see that this one is the data is starting to constrain this. Oh, I should say the data here is the first principal component of an MRI scan and the model running for one heartbeat. So we do again. We're now done 6% of the data. You can see this is getting really constrained. And that one a little bit. And then we run again. Oops. And that's way three. And that was 6% of the data, this is 5% of the data, and we've pretty much run out of it. The data is not telling us anything more. We need to go another MRI scan to actually um, sort out what was going on any further. Okay, this is, this is not a biological example. This is a carbon fibre wafer for <laughs> building aeroplanes. It's probably not really appropriate to this meeting, but the important thing here, this is the MRI space, and we can see this structure. And we went back to the people who gave us this model. They said, oh, yes, we knew about that. There's a cost of the five term in there. So we're discovering things about the data that's definitely there. And we might not have known about it. So some open questions. I'd love to know about the geometry of this not ruled out yet space, but I only have a function that tells me whether I am all right. I have a membership function. I don't know its geometry. I don't know its shape. I don't know its topology. And I'd love to know that design for wave two, because I don't know the geometry, it's very hard to know where to put the points in, in, in Enron space when we come to wave two. This is geometric, not probabilistic. We don't have priors, we don't have posteriors. Um, now, part of that is it came out of Durham, and if you know Michael Goldstein at Durham, you will know that he's really into what's called Bayes linear, where you don't have probability, you only have moments. And this is perfect for that. Uh, I ought to say, we talked about ABC earlier, this looks like ABC, the equations are very like ABC, I would say it's not ABC, because it's the motivation's different, but if you talk to Richard Wilkinson at Nottingham, he will tell you something else, he'll tell you this is a kind of ABC, but I don't think it is. It's really fast, um, and this is, often uses pre-calibration, you zoom in on the NRI, and then we can do a Kennedy or Hagen afterwards. And the other thing I think it brings up, which I think is really interesting, is the interaction between computer and real-world experiments. When do I do another run of my heart model, or when do I do another MRI scan? And I think that interplay is something really interesting, and maybe we can talk about it over lunch or something. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sure I've run out of time. <laughs> um, thank you so much for the interesting talk. Do you have questions? Looks like we have a question online um, by Lawrence. Is history matching limited to continuous parameter space? Sorry? Is it oh. limited to continuous parameter space? Um, yes. <laughs> well, not, no, not, I, I never qualified that. In a form I've talked about, yes, it's limited. It's very hard, it's quite hard to build emulators for non-continuous things. It can be done. Um, but it's a lot more effort, um, so ye, I'm going to say yes, in the form I've talked about, it's limited to continuous parameters, but it can be extended. Okay. Oh, I've got lots, lots of questions at the back. I, I, I've got a question. Um, I was just wondering, so uh, I think you hinted at this at the end, that, that it sort of looks a bit like ABC, and you said it was different, and someone else is similar. So 
So what, why is it different to ABC? Because we're not trying to find a posterior, because <laughs> we're just trying to find the geometry. Um, I mean, it looks like ABC because you look at distances and you have a sort of cliff. <laughs> um, so the equations look like ABC, but the motivation is very different. So we're not trying to approximate the posterior because we don't have any probabilities in here. We're just looking for model runs that are implausible. So that's why I say it's different to ABC. If you, have, you, can, if you put an indicator function on it, on the ABC, you sort of get something similar, which is why Richard... But Richard's an ABC person. <laughs> I'm not, so I think it's different. You know. Great, thanks. Hi, thanks for the talk. That was really interesting. Also, it seems really, really useful for the kinds of things that I do as well. But um, I was wondering, part of your implausibility metric, you have the variance underneath of your, the match of the, of the emulator to the model. I wonder, since you're going through the parameter space to knock out places that are implausible, can you, is it possible at the same time to identify where you might need to refine your emulator if there's like model behavior that only appears in certain parts of parameter yeah, so, space? Yeah, so that's, that's basically what we do. So, Wave one, I build an emulator, and then wave two, I build an emulator on the bit of space that's left. So my emulator is now much better, uh, partly because I'm learning over liminary, and partly because the weird bits of model have gone, because I, I model the whole of model space, and there's weird solutions over here, and they've gone now. So my emulator's a lot better, and then the third time the emulator's even better, it's now getting flat. Probably the quadratic part is taking up most of the effort, so the emulator, the Gaussian process part is doing that. See, as we zoom in, we get a better and better emulator because we're getting to a closer, better behaved model. Yeah. yeah. Makes sense, thank you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, maybe a silly question, but why, why if you, well, what if you skip the model part and just go data to emulator? Sorry, say that again? So what, like, we know like models are wrong, so why don't you just keep the model part and just go from data to emulator to get, for example, for cardiac, like the, like, the chances okay. of an arrhythmia or something okay. like that? So that's the alternative type of modeling, where you just model on the data. And if you just model on the data, there is no discrepancy term because you can, you're not on a manifold. But if you take... Um, if you take the, physic, the, the engineering physics example, we don't want to build a bridge that violates Newton's laws. <laughs> um, now, I'm saying, of course, there's, there's a discrepancy. The bridge isn't quite going to satisfy Newton's laws, but we don't go too far from Newton's laws, and we'd have to get a vast amount of data to teach a neural network neural, Newton's laws. So it's a, we're trying to bring together scientific understanding and data in a principled way rather than just using data or just using some numerical model. Because I would contend that both of those miss something out. <laughs> yeah, thank you for your talk. I'm just curious, I know you skipped over this, but maybe I can just come back to it because since you skipped over this. <laughs> the selection of data points uh, for the emulator. Yes. When you have nonlinear systems, obviously really difficult, so, so I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on, on, on how you do this. <laughs> so I will start off by saying we do not have an optimal solution for this. If you want to work on it, that would be brilliant. Um, so what we generally do, we want to fill space, and there, there are other ways to fill space, but I want to fill space, so what I do is I, I can afford three runs here, so I split space up into three, and for the margin, I make sure I have one point in each of these margins on each edge. Okay. Now, that gives me what's called a Latin hypercube. But not all Latin hypercubes are equal. This is also a Latin hypercube, and I do not like that one. So, as I said, we don't have the formula for the optimal Latin hypercube. So what we tend to do are called maximum Latin hypercubes. We maximize, we take lots of Latin hypercubes and we maximize the minimum distance. So we push points apart. And there's a Latin hypercube. And there's a maximum Latin hypercube. And I think you can see, I hope you can see, that that's more spread out. So, so it doesn't have to follow up. So there's no 
way to maybe oh <laughs> to maybe use uh, the knowledge about the dynamical model that you have to inform this distribution so, yes there there pro there are ways to do it but you've got to be careful that you, your knowledge is right because these are very complicated things what we would do with the sequential design is we would then use the knowledge we gain from our emulator and the uncertainty in our emulator to generate the next point. And that's very efficient. So I probably wouldn't just do a big Latin hypercube, though they are surprisingly efficient. I might do a small Latin hypercube and then fill in the spaces where to build a better emulator. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the complimentary question to uh, Alejandro's. Um, yeah. Can you do it without uh, the data? So Sorry? can you use the method without data? So to sample, in, in your analogy, like a space of, of possible bridges? Oh, um, I mean, there's no data. This, I do this before I run the model. So there's no data here. Um, once I've run the model, I can build my emulator. I've not, I don't need any real world data, because I could just live in model world and predict things for about the model using the emulator. Um, I can't calibrate it with that data, clearly. <laughs> um, so, no, this is done before we have any data. Um, yeah, this is, this is done before anyone runs anything in a computer. Do you make an alternative entry for possibility that doesn't need data variance? Yeah, I'm just wondering if you could, like, <laughs> like a prior, basically. Yeah. No. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, I guess we'll just have one last question. Uh, so, so I was wondering, uh, when building your emulators, I think what you just did was to do a polynomial fit on the few data points you have coming from the expensive simulations. So, so the Gaussian process has two parts. There's a mean function and a covariance function. Now you. A zero mean Gaussian process will fit any continuous function, um, but not very efficiently. Mm -hmm. The same way a polynomial will fit any continuous function, but not only very efficiently. So we use a low order polynomial mm -hmm. to fit the um, large scale variation. And then we have the Gaussian process just to pick up the differences from that large scale variation, because we think that's more efficient. You could just use a polynomial, which would just be polynomial regression, or you could just use a zero mean Gaussian process, but your length scale would be much more complicated. That's I was more. wondering, uh, let's say you made a different choice, let's say you did one of the alternative methods to build the emulator, how would that impact the, the variance coming from the emulator in the denominator of your impossibility term? And so, yeah, okay, so the variance is a property of the emulator. So if I built a different emulator, I would have a different variance, and therefore I would get a different Enroy. Um, if I build two emulators of the same thing with the same design, the, that di uncertainty is not usually much different. Um, if I used a different function for the emulator, if I used a polynomial, for instance, it would be quite different, I think. Uh, and of course, if I used a neural net, I wouldn't know what the uncertainty was, so I couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, um, in the interest of time, let's thank um, Peter once again.